Today, I'd like to talk about sustainable architecture and how the construction industry should be responding to the challenges we face. And frankly, there are only two challenges that we should be talking about today, or any other day for that matter, challenges that affect every other major issue of our time. And they are, of course, the twin challenges of climate breakdown and biodiversity loss. But first, I'd like to talk about some of um, Mark Sparfield Architects' projects. At Mark Sparfield, underlying all our work over the years is a belief that design is a powerful tool for good. At its best, it improves the quality of people's lives and lifts their spirits while drawing on a minimum of the Earth's limited resources. We've been alive to the climate and environmental issues for years, and we've tried to make all projects as sustainable as possible in the widest sense, that is, environmentally, socially, and economically. And the London Eye is um, a good um, example of this. It's a good example of a, social, a socially responsible project. It's our first um, entrepreneurial venture. We had the idea for, and we started uh, a company that developed it, having not won a competition where th that we entered it into. And this project um, is all about understanding the city from a new perspective. And it's also about raising people's spirits. But what not many people know about is the fact that as part of the Section 106 agreement to get the Permanent Planning Commission in 2005, uh, David Marks and I ensured that the local community got 1% of ticket sales in perpetuity. And if we hadn't been part of the client body, we wouldn't have been able to do that. So this is, it's a handy thing to be on the client side as well as the architectural side at some times. And we've also replicated that in Brighton with our British Airways i360 project, where we've also um, pledged 1% of ticket sales to go to the local community. And we've also paid for some of the major regeneration of the seafront in Brighton. We work across many sectors. We don't have a style. We respond to each project as a bespoke design solution tailored to the client's needs and aspirations, the brief, the site, and, and its wider context. Just like to elaborate a bit about the I360. Um, it's obviously a marine environment and it's a very tall, thin um, tower. In fact, it, we think it's one of the tallest, thinnest towers um, in the world. It, is, um, it has an aspect ratio um, height to width of um, 41 to 1. Um, and of course, the only material that you can do that with is, is in steel. And I think really in terms of choice of materials, it's um, the, the kind of approach that we take is to use whatever material is appropriate for the job. And um, if we do use steel, of course, we want to uh, make sure that it's going to last as long as possible. And if you go down to the I-360 in Brighton, you might notice that these enormous bolts that um, hold the, um, the tower down to the foundations and indeed hold each of the cans together um, are in fact galvanized bol um, bolts. So this is uh, something to look out for when you go on your, um, your ride on the I-360. And I'd like to talk specifically about a number of projects that we've done in the past which incorporate a number of sustainability features. This is the Think Tank project from in Lincoln, um, which is a, uh, a project that's now used by Lincoln um, University. And it had many um, sustainable features, not least um, the fact that it's, it's almost entirely naturally ventilated, there's lots of natural light. It has a, a ground source heat pump, um, one of the first, I think, that was, was put in at that time. It has a green roof, um, a Lincolnshire meadow. And um, the whole orientation and design of the massing of the building was um, to maximize um, North Light, for example, if you see on the north side of the building, the serrated edge is orientated due north to maximize light while minimizing um, heat gains. So the whole of the building was designed um, with sustainability in mind. Then our Michael Tippett School that we built in Lambeth um, is of a similar nature in terms of its environmental credentials. 
We designed this to, um, to also maximize natural light. It's got very tall ceilings. It, um, it's got a good deal of thermal mass. It uses a CHP. There's heat recovery because there's a, a hydrotherapy pool. And the uh, materials are very low carbon. Then they came from local um, sourced places. The building envelope is highly insulated. It's um, entirely naturally lit and naturally ventilated. And it has a green roof um, to um, mitigate um, the rainfall. And then um, a domestic house, in fact, um, a house where, where I live, um, is one that we extended and um, in order to make it very green um, about 10 years ago. And this is in a conservation area. And uh, so we uh, managed to replace all the windows with uh, double glazing and make them still uh, to, to the to um, conservation area standards. We um, heat the whole house. Um, it's completely zero carbon in the sense that it's entirely electric. We have a uh, air source heat pump, heat recovery. We have, um, it's entirely naturally ventilated, um, we, but we actually help that with um, the stack effect and um, secure nighttime ventilation. We've made a a gap in the building between the, the main part of the building and the extension at the back where natural daylight is brought deep into the plan. We've used um, low energy lighting throughout and we have a sun pipe and it's very, very, um, in the 10 years that we've um, now had it, it's very low in terms of energy use compared to a, another house of its size. So it's, uh, we've managed to um, track the, um, the energy use over 10 years and found that it's, it's actually working very well. Now I'd like to talk a bit more detail about our latest project um, in Cambridge, which is a mosque. Um, we, um, we were invited to uh, enter a competition in um, 2009, so it's a project that's been going 10 years now. And um, when we first um, thought about the project, we um, did our research, which is what we do with all of our projects, and we found that mosques throughout the world are designed um, very much to fit into their surroundings. They use the local vernacular, they um, use the local building materials, they use um, and fit into the local culture. So a mosque in... Um, Northern Africa is very different from a mosque in Iran, is very different from a mosque in China or Indonesia. And so we posed ourselves the question, um, what should a British mosque be in the 21st century? Um, and we obviously wanted to, we looked at um, Islamic uh, religious tradition as we looked at um, English religious tradition. And what we were trying to do was get a kind of fusion of both, or respecting both traditions within, within the building. And we took inspiration from this image, which is an image of the Garden of Paradise. And from that, we um, developed the idea of a grove of trees that then become structural trees that join um, at the top and then are surrounded by uh, masonry uh, cladding. And we worked very closely with um, Professor Keith Critchlow, who was one of our tutors at the AA, who is, a, um, is, in, is an Islamic geometer. And he, we developed with him the geometry for the entire building. And the, this is the pattern that he drew by hand. He uh, hates computers, so he drew this entirely by hand. And it is the, the breath of the compassionate pattern, which is based on octagons. And this is the geometry that we, um, is the guiding geometry for the whole building. It's, um, and if you kind of look at the, the pattern and how it develops using the octagon into the um, pattern of the trees. And there you see more um, detail how that, how that works. And then the model of the trees here. So looking at the, um, plan. It's a very um, tall, thin site, um, edged on Mill Road at the at the um, far right, or oh, sorry, far left, 
Um, so people will come on off Mill Road, which is quite a busy road, into a community garden, then through an Islamic garden, through the portico and into the atrium. And off the atrium, there's a teaching space and a cafe, which is open to the whole community. And then they'll go pass through the ablution areas into the prayer hall, which, as you see, is at a different angle, angled towards Mecca on the Qibla wall. And, and this is the, the main um, element, which is common in all mosques, that the Qibla wall is orientated towards Mecca. One of the things that we're aware of is that the, the site is um, it's in, within a residential area. So we wanted to make sure that the building was very respectful of its area. Therefore, we kept the massing of the building down towards the, towards the road, and it only rose up um, deep into the site. Um, so in a sense, we were trying to develop a building that, was, um, that fitted in but and standard out, stand, stood out at the same time, because, of course, this is a major religious building um, in the UK. So it had to walk that tightrope um, between the two. It is highly sustainable. There's, it's zero carbon, um, no, uh, no on-site carbon at all. Um, it is, um, we've worked very hard to make sure that it is entirely naturally lit and doesn't need any lights on during the daytime. It's also um, entirely naturally ventilated. And um, it, it has a few um, fans to help it, um, it during Friday prayer or during um, times of high occupancy. Um, but otherwise, it's in entirely naturally uh, ventilated. And it, it is um, powered by a, a, an air source heat pump um, and uh, in combination with photovoltaic panels um, that actually make up 10% of the energy consumption of the building. And um, all of the rainwater is collected and used to flush the toilets and water the garden, the Islamic garden and the community garden. And we, of course, are using um, timber. Um, the, the, it is a, an entirely timber structure, um, not just the trees, which are obviously glue lamb, but also the um, walls, which are cross-laminated timber. And of course, timber is um, very, very sustainable, one of the most sustainable materials that you can use. So this is the massing of the building. You can see the um, solar panels in the front and the uh, Islamic garden, the front, and the dome, which is orientated um, um, towards the Qibla wall. Um, the building is also surrounded by a flat for the imam and also a flat for um, visiting professors, visiting scholars. So this is the, the building that this picture was taken only a few weeks ago, but the mosque has started to be used for prayer um, after its 10-year history. And you can see that as people walk through the Islamic garden, there's a, um, a water fountain, which is very important, water being the source of all life. Um, and through, this is um, showing the portico. Um, and this is the atrium. Um, space which can be used for weddings and for gatherings of all sorts. Um, on the right is the, is the teaching room and on the left is the cafe and there you see spaces for all the shoes. Um, this is one of the ablution areas. This is actually the women's ablution area which is octagonal. Um, and the main prayer hall um, which is con consisting of um, these glue lamb trees with the light coming through from the top, and uh, you can see there the, um, the dome, um, which is just orientated towards the Qibla wall. It is, uh, th th the mosque is designed to be non-denominational, welcoming for of the wider community, and also one of the most women-friendly mosques. Although there is a separate area, there is, it's not divided completely from the whole um, space. That's one of the mosque users. And the dome, um, which is inscribed by a uh, pattern uh, designed by Keith Critchlow, Professor Keith Critchlow. And the walls um, take um, inspiration both from Islamic and, and, and local traditions, again, um, in the two-tone coloring of them. And the pattern that you see in them is um, um, 
that God is the one. Um, you, uh, for anyone who can read Arabic, this is Kufic um, lettering. So there you see the, um, the lettering on the outside. So now I'd like to come to um, 2008. Um, and for this, it was, um, it was when the urgency of the climate crisis really hit home to me. There seemed to be a report coming out every other week. There was a Met Office report, a reports of dramatic species depletion, and there's been one recently. Insectageddon, the loss of insects that we need to pollinate our food, and the big one, the IPCC report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report that came out last October that said we have 12 years, and now 11, to act to limit climate catastrophe. And the New Yorker described it as a collective scream sit through a stern, strained language of bureaucraties. Um, and we saw about a month ago that David Attenborough, what he had to say about um, using less strained and bureaucratic language in his documentary, Climate Change, The Facts. And I would urge anyone to have a look at this if they haven't already done so. He said that we're facing our greatest threat in a thousand years and that we now stand at a unique point in our planet's history and we must all take responsibility. The science is clear and unequivocal. Global warming is happening now, and yet the government is on track to miss its, carb its carbon emission targets. And as Greta Thunberg pointed out when she came to the UK, it's peddling the creative carbon accountancy, pretending that the UK is leading the world when it has effectively banned building new onshore wind, it's supporting fracking, and there are currently more subsidies going to fossil fuels than renewables. I was at the launch a few weeks ago of the UK's Committee on Climate Change report, which is the advice to government recommending that they should target a zero carbon economy by 2050. It's a very good, ambitious report, and we should all watch to see if it's adopted um, and then reflected in the November budget. The UK could and should be world leaders. Uh, after all, we were world leaders in the Industrial Revolution creating the uh, carbon debt that we did then. But the government needs to make the right choices now to do so. And unfortunately, it's a little preoccupied with other matters at the moment, which are much less important in my opinion. Um, buildings and construction play a major part, accounting for nearly 40% of energy-related carbon dioxide emissions, while also having a significant impact on our natural habitats. And for everyone working in the construction industry, meeting the needs of our society without breaching the Earth's ecological boundaries will need a paradigm shift in all our behaviour. Together with our clients, we need to commission and design buildings, cities and infrastructures that have a positive and, if possible, regenerative effect on the environment. The research and technology already exists for us to begin this transformation now, but what is lacking is the collective will and the sense of urgency. This is um, the powerhouse in Norway by Snow Hetter Architects, and I think it's a great exemplar. They've designed this as an energy positive building, which is harder than net zero. It, it, they've calculated that the embodied energy of everything that goes into this building and offset it with the on-site generated power over the 60 year life of the building. This has got to be the future. Um, and it's all about choice of materials as well as energy systems. So we need to advocate faster change in the industry, pressurizing government to up the standards and encourage low carbon technologies like heat pumps. We need to share knowledge in particular to minimize waste, but we also need to collaborate to shift uh, to low embodied carbon materials, but also to materials that will last. Um, like, um, then this is where galvanizing comes in. Because as all of you know better than anyone, it's galvanizing that's all about long-term thinking, and that's what we need. We need also to measure success only through the lens of its climate and environmental credentials and, 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 and impacts. I've become mildly obsessed with this issue in the last nine months, as you may have realized, and mainly because, if I'm honest, it scares me. This is something that we all need to consider, not just in our professional lives, but in our personal and political lives. 
Women didn't get the vote 100 years ago by politely asking, as my great-grandmother understood as a suffragist. And another major event um, that happened in 2018 was the birth of my first grandchild on my birthday, and this does something to you. So in the face of this accidental threat and general and very dangerous complacency, it seemed to me entirely rational to do what I can, including sitting on Lambeth Bridge last November with Extinction Rebellion. Any disruption that they've caused will pale into insignificance compared to the disruption that will come if we don't take urgent action. But there's still time. We need to look at the world, not through rose-tinted glasses, as Marcel Duchamp suggested, but through green, climate, environment-tinted glasses. It should affect every choice that we make, as well as what we eat, how we travel, how we heat our homes, etc., etc., everything. But it's important to remember that action on climate change isn't about having less of what we want, it's about having more of what we need. And this is a, this is a fantastic project um, that's being run by a, a fantastic climate action charity called 1010. And it's called Riding Sunbeams, and they are uh, pioneering um, a project that is um, powering uh, railways directly from solar power. So there's a lot of hope and there's a lot of things that we can do to avoid uh, a climate catastrophe, but we need to get on with it. Thank you.